I lead a rich life on a tiny carbon footprint. Before I describe my story about how I do this, first I want to define these two key phrases, rich life, tiny carbon footprint. I live in Los Altos Hills, one of the most beautiful towns in America. Author Wallace Stegner famously called it God's Little Acre. <laughs> I've lived here for 30 years. I have a nice house. I have a big yard. We have a pool, a jacuzzi. I drive a nice car. We travel lots, averaging about a dozen trips per year. And we have lots of friends. We spend lots of great time with friends. I'm not trying to brag. <laughs> I'm providing a little bit of evidence that I, rich, I lead a rich and active life. Next, what's a tiny carbon footprint? The consensus from global climatologists is that we need to live under one metric ton of greenhouse gas emissions per person per year. For most of my life, I was way above this figure. But in 2020, I managed to beat it by 30% down at 0.7 metric tons per year. Why is this important? In 2005, much to my dismay, I became convinced that green, uh, climate change was real, it was harmful, and it was caused by humans. Before that, I didn't really believe that humans could affect the Earth's climate. And, and probably subconsciously, I didn't want it to be true because it was so grim. The impacts on our children, on future generations, on the billions of people that live in these bright red areas, that's a lot of suffering. So after I became convinced that it was a real problem, I dug in. I tried to learn about it. I learned about greenhouse gases, and I learned about carbon footprints. Collectively, our carbon footprints traced behind us in time back several hundred years to when we started burning coal. Now, don't get me wrong, fossil fuels, coal, natural gas, and oil are incredibly good. They've helped humanity amazingly, but they had a hidden cost, and that is the greenhouse gas emissions. As an engineer, when I found out I had a carbon footprint, I wanted to know how big it was. So I learned about the uh, carbon accounting protocols, uh, mainly developed by a global nonprofit named ICLE. I put them to good use and did our town's first official greenhouse gas inventory and climate action plan, plan back in 2007. I learned a lot about the protocol. Carbon footprints vary tremendously from person to person. So someone who lives in a small apartment, an efficient apartment, takes public transportation, doesn't travel very much, they have a very small carbon footprint. Where you live also makes a huge difference. Americans have the biggest carbon footprint across any large countries. It's been dropping slightly, but we're still way bigger than any other significant country. But what about me? What about my carbon footprint? I use those protocols to measure my footprint over the years up until 2005. It turned out my peak was 39 metric tons of emissions. Now that's way bigger than that target of one metric ton. But I shouldn't have been surprised by this because it turns out people that live rich lives generally have very big carbon footprints. The scientific consensus is that the top 10% of households around the world are responsible for 45% of the global emissions. Now, to me, this is probably the most tragic part of the climate crisis. Those that will be most impacted by it are largely innocent. They will be demographically very different from those of us who are most responsible for it. But feeling guilty about past emissions doesn't help. My emissions, prior to 2005, were already up in the atmosphere doing harm. But maybe I could reduce my pollution. At the time, I had no idea how to do this. Uh, was it, would it require big sacrifices? Is it even possible to live a rich life with a smaller carbon footprint? I didn't really think I could approach that target of, the tiny target of one ton per year. 
but I thought I would give it a try to see how low I could go. Because if not me, who? I'm financially secure, I'm motivated, and I live in Silicon Valley. So I did it. It took 15 years. Some of it was easy, some of it was hard. New technologies helped tremendously. But I didn't have to become a monk. I still lead that rich life. This is how I did it. Getting off gasoline back in 2005 was a daunting idea. Now it is incredibly easy. Anyone with resources can drive electric cars. I started learning about electric vehicles by refurbishing a very old golf cart from 1953. I think there's very few fully functional 70-year-old electric vehicles around here. Then in 2006, my son and I converted an old MG to run on fully electric. Uh, it was a great project. It took about a year. He and I both learned a ton. <laughs> he drove it to high school for a couple of years. Then a few years after that, I found out about brand new, uh, some brand new EVs that were uh, being sold at auction. Ford had made these cars, but then um, got rid of the car model. So we were able to pick this cute little plastic car up for about $15,000. Our daughter drove it to uh, high school for a couple of years, and now 10 years later, it still works great, and it's my wife's favorite car. At the time, there were no long-range EVs, so we also experimented with low-carbon fuels for road trips. Our son had bought a bus, a school, used school bus, while he was in college, and we converted it to run on waste vegetable oil, which is carbon-free. We got our oil from restaurants, and they were generally happy to give it away. Then in 2019, we splurged and bought a used Tesla Model S. This has been a great car. We have put 60,000 miles on this car, often to re remote destinations at the end of long dirt roads. I also tried to bike a lot for, for local errands, but that's pretty tiring living in the hills. Last year we got an electric bike, which are great, and the hills don't bother me at all anymore. <laughs> Natural gas used to be called a bridge fuel from coal to renewables, but we've since learned that the methane leaks out of the natural gas distribution system make it as bad or worse than coal. One of our biggest uses at home for natural gas had been heating the pool. I installed these solar thermal panels back in 2008. 15 years later, they're still working great. Our electricity in California is already extremely clean. And might, like most of the rest of the world, it keeps getting cleaner every year because of the low cost of renewables. So anytime you can switch from a natural gas appliance to an electric equivalent greatly reduces your carbon footprint. We switched our gas cooktop to an induction cooktop. We tried a small portable one first just to see how it worked, and it worked great. So we made the switch. Now we had that old gas cooktop, and uh, it worked fine, but I was reluctant to give it to someone because then they would be using fossil fuels and potentially giving their kids asthma. So we turned ours into a yard fountain. <laughs> we, re we replaced our gas dryer with a combined electric washer dryer. It's half the size, it's far more efficient, and the laundry has gone from a two-step process to a single-step process. We replaced our tankless gas water heater with a much more efficient heat pump water heater. We replaced our old gas furnace and air conditioning system with a Mitsubishi heat pump. Both of them have been working great, and it's probably worth noting that all our electrification projects, including charging three EVs, are being done with our existing, our original electric panel. We took advantage of a new technology called smart circuit splitting and splitters. To, make, uh, to avoid the large cost of upgrading the panel. Another less common use of natural gas in homes is outdoor space heating. There are some electric equivalents that do this, but I thought I'd use waste vegetable oil instead. So I combined an old orchard heater with a tempered glass table. 
And it works pretty well. We've uh, gotten our dinner guests up to about 900 degrees. <laughs> Over the past 15 years, we've uh, really moved away from eating meat. It started out very gradual, just uh, kind of meatless Mondays. And bit by bit, we're now almost entirely vegetarian. My wife, Lisa, is a great cook, and she enjoys trying uh, great new vegetarian uh, recipes, and there's also some wonderful Indian dishes. I have not lost any weight in this process. <laughs> there's also low carbon substitutes now. Uh, oat milk, impossible burgers. We also try and get uh, local produce and local aids, uh, eggs. Shopping locally is, is always more low carbon. Probably the, the diff most challenging part was traveling. And we tried to travel less by air and explored a bunch of low carbon travel options. This turned out to be lots of fun. We used to think that the farther you went from home was what made a good vacation. And now we know that it's really more about the journey. So we started by renting RVs and traveling around uh, the Western United States. Lots and lots of fun. We did this, we did uh, four different trips around the US. Um, no one missed the long, long plane trips to remote destinations. And you see so much more when you're on the ground that you fly over in the air. Then my son bought that school bus and we no longer had to rent RVs. Our first trip was uh, in the RV school bus was down to Southern California to Joshua Tree and Mojave where it actually snowed on us. That's when we discovered the bus heater really didn't work very well. <laughs> but Lisa and I, in 2015, took that same bus 6,000 miles around the U.S. with our two big dogs. Now, we smelled vaguely of French fries during that entire month. <laughs> but it was one of the finest adventures we've had. It was amazing that you drive up in an old school bus smelling of French fries. Everyone wants to talk to you. <laughs> We also tried out a lot of organized bike trips. We did bike trips in California, in Oregon, Canada, Utah, Colorado, Arizona, even Texas. We find that we often did them with groups of friends. And we found the combination of exercise and scenery and uh, great adventures to be just wonderful. Sometimes we'd even take the train to the bike trip, which is saving lots of carbon. Speaking of trains, have you tried Amtrak? We had not, and found it to be a wonderful way to travel. Since then, we've explored most of their major routes all the way around the US. Then we got the Tesla. We have driven it all over the US, <laughs> taken lots of different trips, trying out superchargers all across the US. Uh, it's a wonderful way to travel. We've, driven, we've put on 60,000 miles and had one breakdown, and it was due to a flat tire. Most recently, we got an all-electric teardrop trailer. This has a comfortable bed in it and a compact kitchen complete with an induction cooktop. It's lightweight and it's aerodynamic, so we can tow it behind the Tesla. Okay, so that's how I did it. Uh, at a high level, I started, uh, when I was born, I had zero carbon footprint. I got up to 39 metric tons, and now I'm back down under one metric ton. It didn't require a lot of sacrifices. I'm still leading that good life, and it's getting easier every year. At a, using that same curve at the global level, we're basically in the middle of the climate crisis. We know when it started, when we first started burning fossil fuels. We know why we did it and all the benefits that came from it. Now we know it's harmful. We know we have to stop. We know how to stop. It's just a question of how quickly we do this. I believe those of us with the resources need to lead the way. Okay, a couple of caveats and amendments. <laughs> One, no part of this presentation was created by ChatGPT. <laughs> Two, I'm not a climatologist nor a scientist, so I could have my numbers wrong, but I think they're pretty close. Three, my carbon footprint increased last year to 2.3 metric tons entirely as a result of two essential plane trips. One to keep my marriage intact, the other was for our daughter. And finally, I've completely excluded embodied carbon. Embodied carbon is 
very complicated. It's basically the carbon emissions involved uh, in the creation of a product or a service or your house. Uh, for example, the asparagus that's on the menu, did they buy it at a local farmer's market or did they fly it in from Peru? This makes a huge difference in the carbon content. And for any given product, was the product manufactured with energy from, from coal? We bought a new driveway or got a new driveway last year. I have absolutely no idea how to add that to my carbon footprint. This, these issues are extremely complicated and very difficult to track. When they're easier to track, I will start tracking them. But for now, my strategy is to generally buy less stuff and make sure that the stuff I do buy lasts as long as possible. I live a rich life on a tiny carbon footprint. The main reason I can do this is because I consider carbon in my everyday decisions. Kara Hurst is the VP of sustainability at Amazon, and she describes their strategy as operationalizing carbon. Amazon doesn't make all their decisions based on the carbon analysis, but they do a carbon analysis for all their decisions. I think all of us need to start doing this. Some of you may think I'm a little extreme, and that's probably true, I'll admit to that. Many will not start at 39 metric tons. Most of you will not give up flying to get below one metric ton, but you don't have to give up your rich life to reduce your carbon footprint. Think of these four key ideas. Drive electric, fly fewer miles, electrify your home, and eat less meat. I think you'll all find there are simple ways to dramatically reduce your carbon footprint. Thank you.